The United States has confirmed its first case of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus in a vaccinated traveler who returned to California after a trip to South Africa. Omicron has now been found in two dozen countries. Infectious disease experts are still gathering data on the mutation. We expect to have more information on transmission um, within days, not necessarily weeks. Now, scientists around the world are racing to find out whether Omicron is more dangerous than previous strains of COVID-19. Welcome to your COVID-19 special. I'm Chris Kober in Berlin. It is still unclear what kind of risk Omicron poses and how effective vaccines will be against the new heavily mutated variant. The measures to contain the spread, though, are familiar. Many countries are sealing their borders. Despite the World Health Organization claiming it'll help very little and Dutch scientists saying the variant was already in Europe before it was first detected in a traveler from South Africa. Hunting down the variant. Since Omicron was first reported, the Netherlands has tested airplane loads of people. Health authorities also increased the sequencing of older samples from patients with the coronavirus and found at least two cases of Omicron in Europe before the variant was first reported on November 24. The, the issue is that at the moment a new variant emerges and is announced, probably the spread is already, or the variant is already spread all over the world. I mean, in, in the way these this, this variants of the uh, coronavirus spread, there is no way you can stop a variant from spreading uh, globally, so. There's more evidence Omicron has indeed traveled across the globe. Brazil has confirmed it has identified cases of Omicron, the first in Latin America. Brazil has been hard hit by the pandemic with more than 600,000 deaths. Its vaccine campaign has finally brought back some normalcy. I am really worried because although I am vaccinated, I don't know if the vaccine will help me or not. And in case I get it, whether I will have a strong reaction to this new strain or not. Scientists are still investigating how dangerous the variant is. It does have a high number of mutations. Some are similar to the Delta variant. But even against the new variant, old methods still work. How do we address Omicron? We've said it over and over again, and it, we, and it deserves repeating. If you're not vaccinated, get vaccinated. Get boosted if you are vaccinated. Continue to use the mitigation methods, namely masks, avoiding crowds and poorly ventilated spaces, choose outdoors rather than indoors, keep your distance, wash your hands, test and isolate if appropriate. Stopping Omicron seems impossible. It's been detected in a growing number of countries. Health authorities can only hope to slow down its spread. For more, let's bring in Julian Tang. He's a virologist at the University of Leicester in the UK. Welcome back to the show, Julian. Many people are concerned or even frightened by the emergence of Omicron. How concerned are you? Hi. So um, <clears throat> you need more data. But at the moment, I'm not that concerned for a couple of reasons. One is that the South African reports of the clinical severity are actually quite mild. And the reason that I'm less concerned uh, with that kind of uh, report, and I, I know it's early days yet, is that if you have a very transmissible virus, if it escapes the vaccine uh, protection, but it doesn't cause severe disease, as we see with you know lots of other respiratory viruses uh, every year, then it doesn't really matter. So if hmm. we're getting like lots of cases, like 100,000 cases a day, but say 100 people need to go to hospital, hmm. That doesn't really matter to most people. And in fact, for flu, only a few people get vaccinated because they're the most vulnerable and they're in that hundred that needs to go to the hospital. But the rest of us don't get vaccinated against seasonal flu. And in a way, if that is what's evolving with Omicron, it's, it's, a, it's actually a good thing because then we don't have to worry about vaccine rollout, equitable distribution across the world, because the virus is actually evolving towards more benign phenotype, a benign kind of type of virus that doesn't cause so much trouble in humans. And that would then of the need for vaccination. So, so Julian, there are early indications uh, suggesting that Omicron may be more contagious. And do I understand you correctly? You think that, all right, it may be more contagious, but also may be less deadly. 
Yeah, so the early reports we're seeing from not just South Africa, we've seen a couple of reports from uh, Hong Kong and elsewhere, where cases that have been identified have actually been very mildly, uh, very mildly ill or actually asymptomatic. If that trend continues and we don't see this, uh, these other complications like loss of taste and smell, if there's no long COVID, if there's no PIMS complications in children, then we may be seeing a more benign virus that's more like the other mm. common cold coronaviruses that we already know about. So what are then the next steps to find out more about this variant? So we do what we've always done with these variants. You look at the lab data, look at the vaccine escape capability of these viruses in vaccinated sera. You look at the epidemiology and how the virus is spreading across different populations. But for, most, for me, most importantly, look at the clinical presentation. The clinical presentation is just like a flu-like illness with no complications, no unusual presentations like uh, loss of taste, smell, tinnitus, etc. Then you're dealing with a common cold virus, essentially, against which most of us don't need to be vaccinated against. And that's, that's, that's hopefully what it's going to evolve into. Okay, what is the time frame uh, we're looking at here when it comes to these examinations? So again, as with the previous Delta, uh, Delta Beta, Alpha, Gamma variants, et cetera, uh, the lab testing in vitro will take several weeks to maybe a month or two. It's more difficult with this Omicron variant because there are lots of mutations in the S protein, and that's hard to, in, to create in a, in a lab-based uh, strain of the virus, pseudovirus, for example. But you need a lot of people to be infected uh, for that to be looked at and modeled. And then you need the clinical presentations, and we need to pull all the clinical data together from different countries. And again, that needs a lot of cases. So you're waiting, unfortunately, for more cases to occur before you understand what's going on. Uh, Julian, obviously, uh, getting vaccinated is still a big factor as of now, and as we've also heard uh, in the report. Now, the head of BioNTech says their vaccine will most likely have a strong efficacy against uh, Omicron. The head of Moderna was less optimistic what is your expectation? Okay, so I expect that the vaccines will still work to some extent. Exactly how much? We need to see the real-world data. Even the lab-based data can usually uh, underestimate the vaccine efficacy because the lab-based data just looks at one aspect of the vaccine response. It doesn't look at the whole uh, human host immune system response to the virus. And I think that uh, this kind of prediction of you know routine vaccinations every year going forward we really have to see how much the clinical data tells us about how severe this disease is. Hmm. Uh, we see countries sealing their borders, stock markets tanking. The head of the EU Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, saying prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Does Omicron deserve all the attention it is getting, also in comparison to Delta, which is the prevailing problem in most countries? It's hard to say. I mean, if you look at the early data from South Africa, you know, spreading more rapidly than Delta, but seems to be more benign than Delta, then I see that as a optimistic kind of hope rather than a pessimistic kind of doom and gloom. I'm normally quite pessimistic and quite, uh, you know, half glass, half empty rather than half glass full sort of guy. But I think with this report of loss of taste and smell not being present, uh, I'm thinking that, oh, this might be a sign the virus is actually adapting better in a more benign way to the human host population. And if we don't see those complications, don't see long COVID going forward, seeing more cases that actually don't need hospitalization overall, that may be better than Delta. Hmm. Julian, according to the World Health Organization, around 60 countries are implementing travel measures to guard against Omicron. But the WHO also says blanket travel bans will not prevent the international spread. Why not? Well, we know this already. Normally, by the time you've identified the new variant, as with Alpha and Delta, um, is already spread. And we've seen that in the UK as well. People are seeing it elsewhere, uh, like South America, uh, North America, and, and Southeast Asia. And we know this, that um, detection is always delayed uh, behind transmission, especially with opening of all international borders in some countries, uh, like the UK has been doing in the last few months. So I expect these, this Omicron is already in most European countries and North South American countries, as well as Southeast Asia already. It's just, it just has to be picked up, and it'll be picked up after some amplification in those populations. And we're going to see that in the next few weeks, probably through to the new year. Julian Tang, virologist at the University of Leicester. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you. And we apologize for the problems that we had with the line there. A lot of open questions about the Omicron variant. Scientists have a lot of examining to do. And one of your questions regards just that. 
Here's our science correspondent, Derek Williams. How does a sample analysis laboratory distinguish between variants? Since the announcement that South African scientists had identified the new variant that the WHO has dubbed Omicron, a few people have asked how they were able to do it. So today, let's take a closer look at an at a absolutely groundbreaking technology that in the last 30 years or so has changed the life sciences uh, really more than any other, uh, genomic sequencing. Now, like living organisms, viruses carry around all of the information to make a new virus in their genetic code. Um, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, that's a long strip of coiled RNA made up of around 30,000 chemical subunits called uh, nucleotides. Together, they encode for the 29 proteins that are produced in an invaded cell uh, to make more copies of SARS-CoV-2. Now, if that code changes, a process that we call mutation, it can therefore also change how the proteins are structured. What the WHO calls variants of concern are mutated versions of the virus where changes in the code have made its proteins more effective in some way. So to distinguish between variants in a lab, all you have to do is read the genetic code in the viruses in a sample. Um, it's different and it's identifiable for, for every variant. Reading a genetic code sounds simple, but developing the systems to do it um, was not. We've, we've only recently improved the process to a point where it can be performed quickly and accurately enough to do things like um, detect and track virus variants as they spread. The current generation of systems um, called high throughput sequencers, they've only been available commercially for about 15 years. And detecting viral variants is, is just one thing they can do. The ability to detect genetic similarities and differences in species and in individuals has impacted fields from evolutionary studies to personalized medicine um, in really fundamental ways.